Can we go ahead and announce and introduce our speaker for the night? Hey, 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 I saw me one, two, three. Thank you very much. All right, everyone. Um, today, I'm very excited to welcome our speaker for the night, our amazing Hoopa Ministry Fellow, Damaris Taylor. Whoa! He was the first president of the Harvard Undergraduate Faith in Action back in 2008, Whoa. Back, when there were, back when there were only six guys in the Bible course. Whoa. He was also the first DOXA MC and ministry team leader. So Morgan and Ethan. <laughs> um, because of his family upbringing in the local church, the mentoring of Hoopa ministry fellows and friends, and the leading of the Holy Spirit, Damaris is committed to making and developing followers of Christ who engage their communities with the good news of Jesus. Please join me in welcoming Damaris. Yeah. How are you guys doing? Great. Great. End of another week, right? And uh, the beginning of the weekend where you do lots of work and hopefully sleep in, right? Uh, hopefully, just a little bit. <laughs> I'm going to set my timer up so I don't preach way too long. Um, cool. Well, um, you know, I was texting one of my good friends uh, who actually co-founded HCFA with me. His name is Nathan Nakatusa, and uh, he's class of 2012 as well. And he's actually in town um, this weekend. And uh, just to, to bring it full circle for us a little bit, like he is coming to my church um, this Sunday. Uh, and so, actually, I don't have a photo, but I'll show you guys a retreat um, of Nathan and I in our junior year, um, hugging each other as we're leading at, at retreat. And so, uh, I think it's pretty special that he's coming to hang with me in my church this Sunday. So, um, that's just the beauty of HCFA, excuse me, HUFA relationships, right? Uh, and actually, speaking of community and relationships, tonight, um, the, the, the long title for my talk, and so forgive me for this long title, but uh, it's Compelling Christianity excuse me, compelling Christian community, the necessary commitments for developing, maintaining, and growing Christ in our community. Uh, and so um, I, want to, I want us to think and, and pray uh, deeply about community and the formation of community in HUFA. Um, and, and so there'll be some time for, for Q&A, so be listening and writing down your questions and hopefully we can dive into it and have a little conversation towards the end for a few minutes. But uh, let's pray for a second. Uh, God, thank you for uh, this evening and coming to the end of a, of a great week, uh, hopefully for, for many. Um, but Lord, even if it wasn't a great week, uh, we give you praise because we are living and breathing. Uh, you are allowing us to be and you are sustaining us by the power of your might. And so, Lord, we ask that as we look into the scriptures um, and we think about Christian community, Christ-centered community, that you would... Uh, begin to bring things to our mind, to the forefront of our mind, that you would help us to value Christian community, but you would also help us to remember uh, the purpose of Christian community and what it can mean and do for others and how we can invite others into Christian community, Lord. Uh, and so, God, I pray that this, this, this talk would be so much better and bigger than words that I put on a page not for my own self-glorification, but God, for your glory, for your honor, for your praise. And so open up minds and hearts in this very moment. Challenge us, correct us, rebuke us, do whatever you need to do to us, Lord, to shape us and form us into your image. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. amen. So um, if Harvard taught me anything, it taught me to define my own terms. <laughs> um, so I, in, in that long list of developing, maintaining, and growing Christ in the community and all that stuff, I want to define what I mean uh, so that we are working um, from the same page. And so when you hear me talk about community tonight, um, it, it is you, we all have a, a probably a, a different view of community. Um, but when I'm talking about community, I'm, I'm literally talking about this very simple definition, uh, a group of people connected by shared rhythms, shared values, shared hopes. Rhythms, values, hopes, shared. 
When I say Christian or Christ-centered, I'm, I'm simply meaning something or someone who is or that is Christian uh, or Christ-centered. What it is, it is surrendered to the path, the proclamations, and this is a fun word. I have to look this up. I like it, though. Uh, just to have the alliteration. Pansophy of Jesus. It just means wisdom. That's all it means. Um, and another way to say it is that it, it, it's surrender to the ways, the words, and wisdom of Jesus. That's when something is Christ-centered. Surrender to the ways, the words, the wisdom of Jesus. In other words, Jesus rules. He is the final and supreme authority for all. That's what Christ-centered means. Compelling. This is just straight up out of Oxford Dictionary. Evoking interest, attention, or admiration in a powerfully irresistible way. I love that last piece. Powerfully irresistible way. That it's so inviting that you can do nothing but acknowledge it. You might not agree with it. You might not like it. But you acknowledge it and you are aware of it because it's so compelling. Commitment is the decisive act of dedicating and devoting oneself. Developing. Um, the cyclical initiative to build and build again the relational bonds in a Christ-centered community. I'm going to call that foundational building. We'll get into that in a second. Maintaining simply means the cyclical initiative to inspect the functionality of relational bonds in a Christ-centered community. Another way to put it is a continual inspection. And then growing, I mean by that, the strengthening of relational bonds and an increase in individuals joining the Christ-centered community, which means, again, development and maintenance are required. Short way to put that is additive renovation. And we'll kind of break that down in a second. So I'm going to go quickly because I got a lot of scripture, but I want to get to the Q&A because I feel like we might get to some fun stuff. So necessary commitments for developing Christ-centered community. Um, one, it is the establishment of shared rhythms and practices that draw us nearer to Christ as a collective. It's the establishment of shared rhythms and practices that draw us nearer to Christ as a collective. I bring up rhythms, but I also bring up practices because in the, the connection to both, right, in rhythms really affects our timing. We all know as, as, as busy college students, as busy Harvard students, that hopefully you, you, you live and die by your calendar, right? Uh, in fact, I just bought this, like about a couple months ago, this really cool uh, AI kind of calendar scheduler thing called Motion. Anybody seen it? Oh, you seen that? that they got me. They, they got me. They got me. They got me. It was real. And then I got ADHD, and so it automatically got to me, and it was like, if you got ADHD, get this. Anyway, so calendar. <laughs> Calendaring and timing is huge. And so when we think about the establishment or development of a Christ-centered community, you've got to block rhythms. You've got to develop rhythms as a collective, but also practices. Because practices help you to embody and to do. And when you embody and when you do those things, and you do them with, in the light of drawing you closer to Christ, it is literally cementing a, a, a shared life. And that's really beautiful. That's what we want. Now, you're like, well, scripturally, where do you get that from? Well, Acts 2.42. Acts 2.42. In fact, the, the first Sunday, which was almost a year ago, um, September 18th, uh, our church met for the first time together, and I got to speak on Acts 2.42. And uh, it reads like this. It says, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. You see, in that simple verse, but very packed verse, is shared rhythms and shared practices. It is the rhythm of coming together around the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, and it is the practice of breaking bread and the practice of prayer. And so we need these things. They are necessary for us to have whole and christ in the community. But also, if we were to look at Nehemiah chapter 8. Nehemiah chapter 8 is very interesting. It's when the scribe or the priest Ezra gets up and begins to read the scripture communally with all the people. And as he's reading the scripture, they then begin to break up into small groups and to uh, interpret the scripture and uh, kind of have a conversation about what was just read. And then they go to put it in practice. I'll read it to you. Nehemiah chapter 8 verses 1 through 12 says, And all the people gathered together at the square in front of the water gate. They had a meeting place. It was their rhythm. 
they asked the scribe Ezra to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had given Israel. And on the first day of the seventh month, the priest Ezra brought the law before the assembly of men, women, and all who could listen with understanding. And while he was facing the square in front of the water gate, he read out of it from daybreak until noon before the, before the men, the women, and those who could understand. And all the people listened attentively to the book of the law. And the scribe Ezra stood on a high wooden platform made for this purpose. Here goes all these fun names. Uh, Mathia and Shema and Aniah and Uriah and Hilkiah and Messiah, not Messiah, Messiah stood beside him on his right. And to his left were Padiah and Mishael and Malkajai and Husham and Hashbadana and Zechariah and Meshulam. And Ezra opened up the book in full view of all the people since he was elevated above everyone. And as he opened it, all the people stood up. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. And with their hands uplifted, all the people said, Amen and Amen. Yes, we agree. Yes, we agree, they were saying. And then they knelt low and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. And Jeshua and Bani and Shurabiah and Jamin and Akub and Sepathai and Hodiah and Messiah and Kelita and Azariah and jo Jozaba and Hanan and Peleah, who were Levites, explained the law. They broke them into small groups to the people as they stood in their places. And they read out the book of the law of God, translating and giving meaning so that people could understand what was read. And Nehemiah the governor... Ezra the priest and scribe, scribe, excuse me, and the Levites who were instructing the people said to all of them, this day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people were weeping as they heard the words of the law. They were moved. And then he said to them, go and eat what is rich, drink what is sweet, and send portions to those who have nothing prepared, since today is holy to our God. And do not grieve, because the joy of the Lord is your strength. And the Levites quieted all the people, saying, Be still, since today is holy. Don't grieve. Then all the people began to eat and drink, send portions, and have a great celebration, because they had understood the words that were explained to them. Again, shared practices and a shared rhythm. One more illustration. Psalm 96, verses 1 through 2. Sing a new song to the Lord. Let the whole earth sing to the Lord. Sing to the Lord. Bless his name. Proclaim his salvation from day to day. HUFA, Bible course, go to DOXA, retreats, prayer gatherings, virtual and in-person. Attend worship gatherings at a local church, the first Reformed Presbyterian church. I'll give you a little shout out. Uh, or Aletheia or Western Ave or Pentecostal Tabernacle or on City Life or on and on and on, right? And in this ability to embody and do and have time together, you form shared life because our rhythms and practices many times shape our values and our vision more than our values and visions shape our practices and rhythms. So I started with that because sometimes we all have uh, highfalutin values. We, we, we think we have aspirational values, but it is really the shared rhythms and really the shared practices that begin to truly shape what is our actually our values and what is actually our vision. And so if we're going to develop Christ in their community, we've got to have the shared rhythms and the shared practices. But also, too, there must be the establishment of shared values and vision. I know the vision for, from exec for HUF, HUFA this year is boldly growing the kingdom. Amen. Love it. Boldly growing the kingdom. And so we, we need a shared value and a shared vision. Acts 2.42 again. I'll read it again. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Well, Paul's there. The apostles' teaching. They, they, they had their, their teaching that was Christ-centered and was pointing them to Jesus over and over again and laying out the life of Jesus over and over again. And so they established a shared value with the shared rhythm and practice of being in that scripture and bathing themselves in the vision and value that Christ had laid out. But there was also... If we wanted to go into the Old Testament, there's Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9. It says, listen, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Lord, the, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These words that I'm giving you today are to be in your heart. Repeat them to your children. Talk about them when you sit in your house and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. Bind them as a sign on your hand and let them be a symbol on your forehead. And write them on the doorposts of your house 
and on your city gates. This is the shared value that we hold, that we love the Lord, our God, with all of our soul and our strength and our might. But also Matthew chapter 22, verses 36 through 40. Here's Jesus. He says, teacher, which command in the law is the greatest? And Jesus says to him, he said to him, love the Lord your God with all your heart. We'll hear it again. With all your soul and with all your mind. And this is the greatest and most important command. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And all the law and the prophets depend on these two commands. If you hold these things centrally in your community, in Kufa, these, these layouts of scripture, then we see there is a developing, there is a growing, there is a tightening, a strengthening of the relational bonds. Also another scripture for, for just a shared value and vision. Colossians chapter 2, which we're, we're going to be reading in the next few weeks at Colossians, right? As we start Bible courses next week. Uh, verse 6 says, So then, just as you have received Christ, Jesus as Lord, continue to walk in him, being rooted and built up. I love that imagery. Rooted and built up in him and established in the faith. Just as you were taught and overflowing with gratitude. It is all of that put together, just as an example, that when you have this shared value and this shared vision, you can begin to build a foundation, right? If you've ever paid attention to how a house gets built, uh, you know, they, they dig the foundation, they dig deep, 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 and especially depending on where you are, the soil that you're in, uh, in, in what part of the country, all those good things, you have to dig super deep in order to lay a strong foundation. And so to develop a Christian or a Christ-centered community, we must do and dig a foundation that is uh, committed to, connected to shared rhythms, values, and practices, and shared vision. It is in these shared moments and ideas that ideals that God through his spirit begins to tighten relational bonds and how he causes us to rejoice with those who rejoice and to weep with those who weep, Romans 12, 15. And in the oscillations of the human conditions, the ups and downs in life, in moments of joy and brutal despair, Christ-centered community develops through life together. It only happens through life together. It only happens when you commit to one another. Otherwise, Christian community begins to fall apart unless you have life together. Uh, this week, I had the beautiful opportunity to celebrate in our church family um, the first day of kindergarten for one of the kids in our church. Her name is Athena. Athena is so lovely. She's brilliant and bubbly and my daughter loves her. My daughter calls her Nina because my daughter is only 19 months old and can barely say her name right. She calls her Nina. She's like, Nina, Nina. And she loves to see her and her little brother Lucas. Um, and so that was a, a holy moment this week as we as we sent her off into kindergarten. Um, but also this week, our church um, had a, a, a member whose family member was taken by violence, gun violence. And so I had to go and attend a funeral um, for this family member of our church member. And uh, I sent a text to our church and I said, this week, Romans 12, 15, that we rejoice with those who rejoice and we weep with those who weep. Because we sit in the midst of a shared life together. And so I sent the picture of Athena, but I also shared with our church that we had lost someone senselessly to gun violence. Next thing, a necessary commitment, we have to have a necessary commitment to maintaining Christ-centered community, maintaining it. You see, uh, you can only maintain what you actually inspect. You can only maintain what you actually hold accountable. Right. And so um, you, you don't know if you're developing or moving forward unless you have some metrics that you can look at. Now, metrics don't always have to be quantitative. They can be qualitative. Right. Uh, and so I think one of the ways in Christian community is that we need to rely not only on the quantitative, but we need to rely on the qualitative as much. Uh, is so important. And one of those things is that uh, in order to have this maintenance of our Christ in the community, we have to check that the circle is unbroken. What do I mean by that? We have to check the circle is unbroken. 
You see, in our communities of faith, whether they be in your local church or they be Hufa or they be some other community on campus, you have to, um, I, I don't like to draw uh, boxes when I think of community, I like to draw circles. Circles that are intertwined, that are concentric. Uh, that just makes sense in my brain. And so uh, I, I think when you go to check to make sure the circle is unbroken, you are inspecting it continually, checking on this person and that person. Maybe you text them, maybe you grab lunch with them, maybe you have see them in Bible course, or you check on them at DOXA, but you check in and you support. There's a scripture in Exodus chapter 17, verses 8 through 12. Moses is leading the people of God, and they come to a battle like they always come to, it seems like. There is a battle at Rephidim uh, against the, Amalek, the uh, Amalek, and they came in to fight against Israel. This is verse 9. And Moses said to Joshua, select some men for us and go fight against Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the hilltop with God's staff in my hand. And Joshua did it. Moses had told him and fought against uh, Amalek while Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. Here's the key part. Listen to this part. And while Moses held up his hand, Israel prevailed. But whenever his hand went down, Amalek prevailed. But when Moses' hands grew heavy, they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat down on it. Then Aaron and Hur, H-U-R, supported his hands, one on one side and one on the other, so that his hands remained steady until the sun went down. So Joshua defeated Amalek and his army with the sword. And there's so much in there. But what I'm saying, what I want you to take from this and hear from this, is that the way that the circle was unbroken is that they were checks, ends, and there was support. Aaron and Hur came up with Moses onto that mountaintop, that hilltop, and they literally held his hands up so that he could do the work that God was calling him to. So maybe you are a Moses, and maybe you need an Aaron and a Hur to lift up your arms in seasons where you just get tired, seasons where you're ready to give up on God, but yet you have an Aaron and a Hur on your side. Or maybe you are Aaron and Hur to somebody who is growing beleaguered with trying to seek after Jesus, and they have doubt after doubt that washes over them, and they're frustrated by certain familial circumstances that are crowding their mind, and everything else is just not going right, and so they need you to be their Aaron or their Hur to literally pull up their arms and hold them until daybreak comes. And so we learn to support one another. But also, I want you to hear this scripture. John chapter 11, Jesus is going to see Lazarus. And Mary and Martha have sent word that Lazarus is so sick, he's so ill, it is, it, he's on his deathbed. Jesus keeps doing his thing. Jesus keeps doing his thing. Mary and Martha, finally Jesus comes. Lazarus has died. Mary and Martha are like, where have you been, Jesus? My brother has been dying, and you knew he's been dying. We told you he's about to die, and yet you stayed a few more days away from him. Anyway, Jesus comes, and the shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept, John chapter 11, verse 35. He weeps with them. He comes to finally check in and support them. And then what does he do? He goes to the tomb of Lazarus. And people are like, Jesus, you're crazy. Why are you about to go to this tomb? You know, in the old King James Version, they say he stinketh. <laughs> yeah, I find that funny too. I find that funny too. And so when they go to the tomb, he finally calls out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And then you have an I am statement from Jesus. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. It is only by checking that the circle is unbroken in our communities that we can support. It is only that we, when we check in and support, can we begin to proclaim rightly that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Because if we aren't checking that the circle is unbroken, we have no way, we have no connection to build community, to strengthen those ties all for the glory of God and for his goodness. 
Another thing I want you to think about when maintaining uh, community, Christian community, is to live into the principles of the one another. And I just want to read off these scriptures because there's so many one another's, but I think they're powerful by themselves. John 13, 34, love one another. Romans 12, 10, be devoted to one another. Romans 12, 10, honor one another above yourselves. Romans 12, 16, live in harmony with one another. Romans 14, 19, and 1 Thessalonians 5 through 11, 5, 11, build up one another. Be like-minded towards one another. Romans 15, 5, accept one another. Romans 15, 7, admonish one another. Romans 15, 14, greet one another. Romans 16, 16, care for one another. 1 Corinthians 12, 25, serve Serve one another, Galatians 5, 13. Bear one another's burdens, Galatians 6, 2. Forgive one another, Ephesians 4, 2. Be patient with one another. I know I need to practice that. Ephesians 4, 2. Uh, speak the truth in love, Ephesians 4, 15. Be kind and compassionate to one another, Ephesians 4, 32. Speak to one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. I am a new name written down in glory. Ephesians 5, 19. Yeah, we're going to skip that. <laughs> Submit to one another. Ephesians 5, 21. And consider others better than yourselves. Philippians 2, 3. And look to the interest of one another. Philippians 2, 4. Bear with one another. Colossians 3, 13. Teach one another. Colossians 3, 16. Comfort one another. 1 Thessalonians 4, 18. Encourage one another. 1 Thessalonians 5, 11. Exhort one another. Hebrews 3, 13. And stir up, provoke, stimulate one another to love and good works. Hebrews 12, 10, 24. Show hospitality to one another. First Peter 4, 9, employ the gifts that God has given us for the benefit of one another. First Peter 4, 10, and clothe yourselves with humility towards one another. First Peter 5, 5, and pray for one another. James 5, 16, and confess your faults to one another. James 5, 16, that's the positives. But the negatives might be how not to treat one another is do not lie to one another. Colossians 3, 9. Stop passing judgment on one another. Romans 14, 13. Another way to say is operate with the suspicion that everybody is dope. Um, and if you keep on biting and devouring each other, you'll be destroyed by each other. Galatians 5, 15. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. Galatians 5, 26. And do not slander one another. James 4, 11. And don't grumble about each other. James 5, 9. You see, if we're going to maintain community, we have to live into these one another's. It's just that practical. It's just that real. It's just that good, right, to, to sit with. Because if we're going to strengthen our bonds and if we're going to see relational growth within our communities for the sake and the goodness of Jesus Christ being made known to others among us and around us, we got to live those things out. Lastly, commitments for growing Christ-centered community. I think this is the point for uh, that, that brings about a compellingness, an attractiveness, an irresistible community. Today I walked into the HCFA um, office and I, I walked in and I was like, hmm, this smells good, they have a candle roll. <laughs> it's good. I love it when I come home also, like uh, when my house is clean and my wife wants to put on a really cool candle. I love sandalwood, by the way. Uh, and the sandalwood candle that she puts it on, I'm like, hmm, this is good. <laughs> all is well type of feel. It's irresistible to me. It's compelling to me. It compels me. It woos me to come and be like, let me just sniff a little bit more of this. This is great, right? So the same thing with HUFA. In this community, what makes you compelling as a community to the Harvard community at Y? Yes, you are the truth carriers because you are the followers of Jesus Christ. Yes, you are the grace carriers because that is what we do. We live out and pour grace and mercy on people. That's what we do as Jesus followers. But what makes you compelling? Is it that? Do they know you by your love? What do people know about HUFA? What do people know about you and your Bible course? What do people know how do we make this a compelling Christian community? If I had to sum it up, I would say we need to have additive renovation. What I mean by that is that we, when the house is being built and sometimes if you've lived in it for a while and you have some children and you had a three bedroom house, but then you got four children, then after having four children, you're like, I need some more bedrooms. So I got to have an additive Renovation. I might, it might have been a single family home, or sorry, a single story home. Now I got to add on a second story to that thing. Got to grow it because our family grew, right? 
And so with a growing uh, Christ-centered community, here's some, 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 some practical things, principles, points, and I got some scripture for it. Uh, excuse me on how I say this, but I feel like it's really important. We've got to obliterate the practice of the holy huddle. If you were at pre-retreat, I'll talk about this very briefly, but I want to talk about it a little bit more. Uh, the holy huddle is when you get in a Christian community and you lock arms so tight. Let me pray and cry and be fasting and reading the scripture. I'm going to be all up in Colossians. I'm going to memorize it all day, all 95 verses. And you lock arms so tight that nobody else can even peer in. That's a problem. Reason why? Because when I read Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 3, he says, and this is Jesus and Zacchaeus having an interaction. He entered Jericho and was passing through, and there was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector. He's the sinner in the story, and he's far from God in the story, and he was rich. And he was trying to see who Jesus was, but he was not able because of the crowd. And then it goes on to say he was short. I appreciate that. He was short, but it was the crowd. It was the people clamoring after Jesus. But it was also the people who caused the barrier to him knowing the Savior. So if a compelling, if we're going to be a compelling Christian, Christ-centered community on this campus, we have to make sure that our arms are, yes, linked together, but not so tight that people can't break in. Secondly, practice the caring, personal invite to Jesus. In the same story, if you were to keep reading in verse 4, it says, So running ahead, this is Zacchaeus, he climbed up a sycamore tree to see Jesus. And since he was about to pass that way, and when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, because today it is necessary for me to stay at your house. Jesus practiced the caring, personal invite. Yeah, and that text message you send to somebody to, to, to come to Doxa or to be a part of your Bible course, put their name in it. Put their name in it. Put their name, call them out. Billy, we'll just use Billy, excuse me. Uh, Billy, I would love to see you tonight to have to hang out with me at Doxa. Billy, uh, I would love for you to come in and, and study uh, the, the book of Colossians with me this semester. Practice the caring personal invite to Jesus. And lastly, actively remove all human-made obstacles to Jesus. Luke chapter 5, verse 17 through 26. It's the last scripture I got for you. Um, Jesus is healing some people, and there is a group of men who have a friend who is on his sickbed. And what do they do? They go and tear off the roof and lower him down where Jesus is. Let's read it. And on... Those days while he was teaching, Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and also from Jerusalem, and the Lord's power to heal was in him. And just then some men came carrying on, carrying on a stretcher a man who was paralyzed, and they tried to bring him in and set him down before him. And since they could not find a way to bring him in because of the crowd, okay, hear that holy huddle piece. I'm not going to stand alone, but just hear that. Um, they went up on the roof and lowered him on the stretcher through the roof tiles into the middle of the crowd before Jesus. And seeing their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. Then the scribes and the Pharisees began to think to themselves, who is this man who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But perceiving their thoughts, Jesus replied to them, why are you thinking this is in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or say, get up and walk? But so that you may know the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he told the paralyzed man, hey, bro, I tell you, get up, take your stretcher and go home. And immediately he got up before them, picked up, what he had been lying on and went home glorifying God. Then everyone who was astounded and they were giving glory to God and they were filled with awe and said, we have seen incredible things today. It is through this actively removing human-made obstacles to Jesus. Can I tell you a quick story? My, my father, uh, my, my birth father, um, uh, he, he was um, 15 years old when, when um, I was born. And my dad is not a believer still to this day, yet I'm praying for him. But I'll tell you this. I heard a sermon one Sunday as I was sitting in this church in Texas where I lived at the moment. And the pastor preached about creating stumbling blocks. 
And I began to just cry because I realized that my father may not know Jesus yet because so many people had placed stumbling blocks that were human made in front of the good news of Jesus Christ. If we're going to be a compelling community and if we're going to see how the Lord works, then it must be that we remove these human made obstacles to who Jesus is is if we're going to be a compelling community we must be really really willing to remove the tiles of the roof and lower our friends down to the center point of where jesus is now that may not mean bringing them to docs that may not even mean bringing them to uh, to bible course that may mean that you have to open your mouth and profess the goodness of god in your life and it also may mean that you may have to lay down certain things that you think it means to be Christian, but really it's just socially constructed. And so we've got to be so active at removing these human-made obstacles to Jesus so that our community can boldly grow the kingdom of God with double ACF and soul food and everybody else who want to name the name of Jesus on this campus, whether they are in a Christian community on campus or not, whether they go to some church different than yours. But if we want to boldly grow the community of God on this campus for the kingdom of God and for his glory and sake alone, then we must be committed so strongly to a centrality of Jesus Christ. Practically, there's something you can do to begin to maintain, develop, and continue to grow this community. And I'm going to give a shameless plug. September 22nd through the 24th. Hey, we can go to retreat. In fact, I'll tell you this. And I'm not saying this might not be your story, but this was my story. Thank you, Lordy. My wife, I met her her freshman year at the fall retreat. It was in Vermont. And this, I was singing a little ditty Christian song, a little gospel song, and then she started singing, glory, glory, hallelujah, since I laid my burdens down. And then I said, you know that song? She said, yeah, I do. And she started singing it, and I went and called my mom. I said, mama. <laughs> um, I met this girl here. Anyway, I got the ring now. Um, and, and so, go to retreat, build that community, um, but also I want to say this, retreat is an opportunity not only for you to deepen relationship with Christ, but it's also the opportunity to invite someone else who may be skeptical, who may be curious about your life and what you're doing because they see something in you that is different. There's a compellingness about how you're living your life and you didn't even open your mouth to tell them that you're even a Christian or they may not even know. But here's your opportunity to practice that invite. Invite them. Right? I think it's $50 for first time people who go, right? So maybe you have a friend or someone in a different club or even your block mate or your roommate to go to retreat as we openly lay out the good news of Jesus Christ. Let me pray. Um, God, thank you for being a God who values community, being a God who wants to see us have strengthened relational bonds. But Lord, I pray that we would never get it confused, that we would never think that strong community is the thing that solidifies us when it is really, truly being on mission for you. And so in community, we walk into mission. We, in community, we walk in this vision of growing the kingdom, boldly growing the kingdom of God here on this campus. And so, Lord, we rebuke and pull down every stronghold on this campus that does not want to see the light of God be lifted up. We call you right now the God who makes ways in the wilderness. We call you right now the God who will open hearts and minds of folks who are far from you. I am reminded that your hand is not too short to save. And so, Lord, I pray for those who have stumbling blocks that people have put in front of them to your goodness. And so let us be such a compelling community that we would remove every stumbling block that we possibly can for the sake of the gospel, because we will not be ashamed. 
of the good news of Jesus Christ. We will proclaim his life and his death and his burial, his resurrection and his ascension for the glory of God and for the good of all people, as Adam Avery would say. But Lord, we thank you, Jesus, that you are a God who has given us community at the same time. People who we can weep with, people who we can laugh with, people who we can do peace sets with, people who will edit our papers, and for relationships that might even be. Um, and so, God, thank you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Everybody say amen. amen. Let's do some QA. We got some time for QA? All right. I think I got it right on the dot. Okay. QA. Well, we got a few minutes. Anybody got any questions or comments? Sorry, Amy. Ava. Sure can. Yeah. Uh, second, where do you think the biggest stumbling block is for fellowships in like pursuing this community? Mm -hmm. Is it the checking the circle? Is it sort of being too tight? You know, which group it is? Do you mean in general or specifically? Uh, if you, if you want to speak specifically to HUFA, that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> I think. Uh, I mean. I've only observed you guys a little bit, so I don't, I don't, I don't fully know everything. But from my observations, um, hear this: I think the circle could be too tight, and um, I think sometimes Christians, and this is in general, this is not just for Luther, but this is for all Christians. The circle can become so tight, one out of necessity because we're struggling. Or two, because we feel the resistance of the enemy, or we feel the resistance of culture in general. And so we pull in the wagons, and we pull in the wagons to protect ourselves. But I think if we walk in cruciformity, and what I mean by that is we walk with this way of living into the cross, which calls us to vulnerability and sacrifice, then we have to loosen, even in the midst of being attacked. And I know, Hufa, there are certain perceptions on campus about various things and situations um, that we don't have to get into right now. But I think it, it can cause uh, the fellowship to draw in when it needs to open up more and continually to be vulnerable, even if it's to attack. So yeah, that's my thought. That's my quick thought. Yeah, yes ma'am. So there is a tension, right? And the tension that exists is valuing the inwardness of the community or valuing the outward facingness of the community. That's what I hear you ask me a little bit about. And I think, um, yeah, in, in terms of the things that you can flex on, uh, I think you have to always start with the things that you can't flex on. Um, and I think in Christian community, uh, it, there, there, and I tried to mention it very briefly at the beginning, was um, it, it, it has to be Jesus is Lord. If Jesus is Lord um, and Savior is not part of a Christian community, it probably ain't Christian. Um, and so uh, Jesus is Lord is something that you can never give up on. But I think if you start down that road, um, it and you stay down that road and you cling to that, there's lots of things you can say are secondary or tertiary or even the fourth level. I don't know what to call it right now. Right? Hey, there you go. That's the Marvel students. All right. And so, right, as you and and, and so 
I, I think some of the things that are you do you want to know a specific thing like that I think you can actually yeah, waver on? Uh, I think something that you can actually waver on in pub for the next doxa uh, is what you think about baptism. Um, right? Whether you are a believer's baptism person or are you a paedo baptism? Some of y'all know what I'm talking about, some of you don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, right? And so I think you can you can waver on, on that type of thing. Um, right? But I, or um, <laughs> by my house there's this sign of this church, and I laugh. I shouldn't laugh. I'm sorry, Jesus. Uh, <laughs> there's this church, they're like, we are a KJV preaching church. And I know what they mean. They mean that they don't think that any other translation is inspired. And I laugh because I'm I just think that's funny. But uh, I disagree with my brothers and sisters in Christ on that. I'm like, no, I'm reading the CSB today, or the NLT, or the NIV, or the ESV, or the NRSV. Anyway, so um, I think you can, can, can flex on that. But my main point is I, I don't think you can flex on the centrality of Jesus. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, so back when HCFA was still HCFA, and it was only six guys, how would Um, so Nathan, if you met, so Nathan is a very meticulous man. Um, he, he actually keeps a spreadsheet to this day of like when he's supposed to check in on people. Um, this is, this is Nathan. Yeah, this is Nathan. I love that too. This is Nathan. Uh, so Nathan is like, um, this is just the giftings that God gave us in the six. But then we also had Carl Mom. Carl Mom was like, the super happy, jovial Ghanaian man uh, that we had from, from Ghana. And, and then you had me, uh, who is loud and jumping around all the time and stuff. Um, and so uh, I think that the Lord just, and, and we had Nick and Don, obviously. Um, and I think that the Lord really used that mixing of giftings and practicing the invite, like I talked about, um, to... To, like, for example, I mean, for me personally, I just like to roll deep. So everywhere I used to go on Friday night, whether it be party or not party, I was rolling with at least five or six people. Uh, so when I was going to Doxa, y'all going to Doxa with me. If we roll into the party, hey, let's go, right? <laughs> so um, it's, going, it's, it, it, it's, it's practicing the invite, and I, I think that was really key. Uh, and I think also trying to live authentically. Live authentically. So people knew that if I was bouncing in a party, they knew they was going to see me bouncing at church on Sunday morning, too. And they knew the same Jesus that had that I was bouncing with in church was the Lord of my life at that party. So there were certain things that I was doing and was not doing. Okay. So anyway, yeah. Does that answer your question? Okay. Cool. Then we got maybe quite time for one more question. Doing the one another's, whether like positively, like where somebody yeah. went above and beyond to love you well or forgive yeah. you, or negatively, where you, you know, yeah. Yeah, I got a positive one, no, okay. or negative ones today. Um, yeah, I think uh, <laughs> I think the, the the positive one where where I specifically felt extremely loved, um, and it's weird, but it, uh, we were at a retreat, a winter retreat, and uh, a guy named Andrew Garbarino. And Andrew uh, and I, we did something kind of crazy. We went out in the snow in just shorts <laughs> and ran into the snow and jumped and rolled around all in the snow like crazy. I'm a black man from South Carolina. I ain't never did that before. In my life. <laughs> and so uh, we did that. I was like, white boy from Texas, what you got me out here doing? We rolled around in the snow acting all crazy. And then we ran immediately and got into the sauna because the place where we were hanging out was the sauna. Oh, had a sauna. Yeah, had a sauna. It was, this was in Vermont. And so that little, and we got, I got a picture of it actually, of, of us like just faces and chest full of snow. Um, and that moment for me symbolized, symbolizes for me that one, I was willing to put down my barriers, try something new, but also I felt really loved because I felt like, oh, man, this is my brother. And even one doxa, Andrew and I, we had a, a twin doxa. Uh, like we, we had like a twin theme doxa where everybody dressed up like a twin. Uh, and, uh, 
And so Andrew and I dressed up because we're crazy, and we had on Sperry's khakis and a black shirt, and I got a picture of it. I'll, not today, but I'll bring it to retreat. I'll try to remember it. Uh, and so that just reminded me that we were sharing life with each other, um, and I love that. Yeah. So, Thanks, bro. Thank yeah. You. Thank you, guys. All right. I'll, I'll give up time.